Hello again and welcome to the 322nd consecutive airing of Forum for a Better Understanding and I think the most beautiful one that we have yet produced. Today our project is to visit the ongoing beautiful restoration of St. George's Greek Orthodox Church here in Fresno. We are going to be seeing the beautiful iconography that has been recreated and in fact brand new created by Russian artists who came to visit us and have done a magnificent work. On our panel today to discuss this project, we have three guests who are lifelong members of St. George's Greek Orthodox Church. To my left is Bob Sexton, who was one of those 10 people on the committee that 10 years ago started working on this restoration project. To his side is his beautiful wife, Helen, who with him has been there since day one at the parish, and they were in fact married there at St. George Greek Orthodox Church. And across from me is Chris Rokas, a retired lawyer and a person that since baptism has been a proud and active member of this parish. He's a historian and knows more than anyone else probably about the beautiful history of St. George's Greek Orthodox Church. I'd like to begin, if you don't mind, with your, your pastor, Father Jim Pappas, when I asked him to describe the parish's history before this magnificent restoration project began. The first Greek immigrants came in the late 1800s, but in 1923, they began to organize themselves and see the necessity to hold the community together. And the best way that any Greek could do that was is to design a church community, was to create a church community, one of love and togetherness to hold together their, not only their faith, their religion, but also their Greek culture. So everything was combined together. As the community grew, they developed and built a church down on the west side, which is still in existence. It's around the Kearney Arch. It's around A Street and Kearney. And the building is still there. It is a Protestant community now. But in the, er, the late 1940s, early 1950s, it was realized that we had outgrown that community, outgrown the building itself, the edifice. So with the leadership of Father John Limbarakis and the board of directors at the time, they built this one at the farthest reaches of Fresno. In fact, some of the community had said, the community members had said, what do you want to go all the way out there for? Now look what's happened to Fresno. I mean, we're way out. <laughs> you know, it north, going towards uh, Copper, uh, Copper Hills and, and beyond. But the community itself put their emphasis and their love into creating orthodoxy here and Greek orthodoxy here in Fresno. It's a beautiful, it was a beautiful time for them. It was a sad time for them to move the church here, uh, which is now central Fresno. But even the foundations were laid by those within the community. So we had an engineer who was also part of the architectural team that helped design the, the, the church, which is a basilica style church. And then we even have film footage of some of the board members and other members of the church who were uh, digging trenches and such. So it's, it's fun to see just how much of the, the body of Christ itself was involved in building this edifice that we have, which is present day St. George. It was completed in 1955. And so the edifice itself, the stained glass windows, and the iconography that is in the front of the church, in front of the altar, plus the large icon, what we call the Platitera, which is the, the Virgin Mary, the Queen of Heaven, with Jesus, which is really traditionally called an icon of the Incarnation, which is the nativity icon of the church, showing God becoming flesh, uh, and her womb opening and out comes God in the flesh, the, which is the large icon here just behind me where I, where I stand. They were all original to 1955. And then we moved on. And over the so many years, up until 2000-something, we decided we needed to finish the iconography in the church. Chris, is there one little detail maybe that you'd like to add to Father Jim's quick run through the time before the restoration? Uh, yes, one of the reasons they, the church was built on the west side 
because that was the center of the Greek community of Fresno when it started out about 1898. Wow. That was the first Greek family that came. And there's actually two parts of the Greek community. One is the spiritual part, which is a church, and the other was the uh, business part, which was on F Street, just north of Fresno, Fresno Street. You know, Father Jim is a wonderful pastor. He's recently been on a program at 49, but he really can get into good answers to my questions. I asked him, what was this project of your committee, Father Jim? How difficult was this project going to be to restore the beauty of St. George Greek Orthodox Church? Let's hear Father Jim again. George Janopoulos, who's a, a faithful parishioner here in this community because he's adept at well-organized thoughts in how to create something like this and make it happen. I, that's not my forte. That was definitely his. And so he put together a whole proposal, we sent the proposal out to a number of iconographers. Uh, we got responses from those iconographers. Some of them actually came out and looked at the edifice and then gave us bids. And the problem we ended up with was is finding iconographers who could mimic what we already had. Because iconography has a 2,000 year history. And there are various schools and various traditions in various areas where iconographers come from. And if you're Romanian, there's a bit of a Romanian touch there. If you're a Greek, there's a Greek touch. And if you're a Cretan Greek, there's a Cretan touch. And if you're Constantinople, there's a Constantinopolitan school. There's a Russian school. And yes, iconographer, iconography all has its main formats and main emphases and, and, and things that are the same and similarities to it. But then there's also that feel from that particular area of origin. And so we needed to find somebody that can match this. So it took a quite a while. And there are some Greek iconographers that came, looked at it, and said, mm, won't touch it, because it wasn't their style. Others tried to do what it was, but it was too far from their style as well. So eventually, George found this couple. And it was this couple who uh, invited us to even St. Petersburg, Russia, to take a look at their work. And so this is where we, we ended up with. And, and like I said, in, in, in one of my earlier comments, it was about 16, 16 different iconographers we looked at before. We, you know, Father Jim wasn't the only one that was able to tell us the difficulties of this uh, project that's still going on. It would have been also George Giannopoulos, who was maybe the chair of that fantastic committee that for 10 years labored on this task. Let's hear what George, how he sizes up what was going to be the difficulty of this uh, experience. With uh, a, a very uh, handsome a donation, a contribution by a parishioner who said um, this church needs a Pantocratora, that's the figure of Jesus Christ. All Greek Orthodox churches have that figure in some form or another on the ceiling. Father Jim and I discussed that at, for some time and we sort of agreed that yeah, it would be, uh, it would be uh, wonderful to have just such a, a figure of Jesus Christ as do all the other Greek Orthodox churches, but you needed more. It needed an overall design to cover a, an otherwise blank ceiling, a ceiling left undone in the 1950s when this church was first uh, constructed, completed. So the task then was to come up with some, some sort of design, an overall artistic, iconographic design that could be, uh, that could be placed on the ceiling and complete the artwork that was begun back in the, in the 1950s. So Father Jim asked me if I wouldn't chair this effort, and, and I said it would be a real challenge. We uh, put together a committee. I chaired that committee, and I must say that this committee uh, existed for a period of 10 years. We started in 1999, and uh, the, uh, the immediate challenge was to, was to see if we could find uh, somebody in this country 
or in this world for that matter, who could come up with an overall design that was satisfactory to, to, uh, to, this, to us, the parishioners in this church. And that also matched the style of iconography that existed here uh, from 50 years prior. We sent out proposals, requests for proposals from any number of, of artists, iconographers uh, around the country. Um, and little by little, we received their proposals. We received sketches. We received cost estimates. We evaluated them over a period of time. We rejected many of them. Some looked positive, others did not. Um, but, but it was pretty clear that, that, that there were great challenges here to uh, the common iconographer. Iconographers generally found themselves painting a single, a single piece of art, an icon. Rare, rare were those who could come up with a design that would cover the, the scope of the ceiling. The ceiling is 45 feet by, by 70 feet. That's a giant piece of canvas up there that would be, uh, would, would, would contain the design and the iconography that, uh, that they proposed. One by one, we, we saw proposals, we rejected, we saw proposals, we rejected. We, we had proposals from, peop from uh, iconographers all over, from all over the country, from Greece, from Italy, from various parts of this country. And it was almost at the point in time that we were ready to say, we can't find. Does the committee want to help us appreciate, like George did, um, your hard labor? Bob, Helen, what was it like working with this uh, challenge you had? Well, just, just looking at all the the proposals in itself is, is, a, is a major task to begin with. But then finding those who really took up the challenge to match what we had was, was the, the hardest part because it's, it's almost a unique style. And uh, there were not many who really could do that. No. Helen, how did um, the committee come to be these 10 people um, what type of people were they? Well, basically, they had to be voted at the General Assembly. Uh, we have two General Assemblies a year uh, for our church, for the community. And basically, uh, the ones that were really interested in seeing uh, the, um, the completion of the church, because the, 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 the church was not complete without the iconography on, on, on the ceiling. Um, uh, and... Uh, I, I come directly from Greece. I was born and raised there. So the churches there are all completed, you know, with, with an iconography. So I wanted to see that in our church over here. We're in the process. Uh, we still have a little ways to go to complete it, but we're very pleased with what's uh, been done so far, and we're looking forward to, to seeing it completed someday. You've done such a wonderful job thus far, and so have we. We're taking our break at this point, We'll be back in one minute, so please don't go anywhere because we're going to learn a lot more and see some more fantastic art from St. George Greek Orthodox Church here in Fresno. KNXC thanks all its loyal viewers and respected businesses who have supported your Catholic television station. Now you can support KNXT with program underwriting by having your name, your company's name, or organization associated with your favorite program. Detailed information about you or your company will appear before and after each program or day part you select. Keep the quality and spiritual message alive and make a difference. Call 559-488-7440 today or go online at knxt.tv to find out more about program underwriting on KNXT. Hello again and welcome back to our fantastic program today on the Greek Orthodox Church, St. George's here in Fresno, and the continuing restoration, rest, restoration project of the iconography on its magnificent ceiling. We're talking with the committee. We heard George Giannopoulos at the point of almost giving up after seeing things that were just not going to do it. So let's see what George says Instead of giving up 
Let's hear what they finally decided they needed to do. Uh, I was put in contact with, uh, with uh, an iconographer in Russia, St. Petersburg. I had traveled to St. Petersburg before. I had seen what they have up there, the artistic uh, qualities of places like the Hermitage and others were just uh, always uh, overpowering. And, and this person that we were put in contact with was a, on the staff, on the faculty of the um, Academy of Fine Arts in St. Petersburg. This academy was founded in the 1700s, at the time of uh, Peter the Great when he was founding St. Petersburg, uh, one of the more prestigious art institutes in, in the world. And uh, this, this person that we were, we were introduced to was on the faculty there, had trained there, had trained others there, and had now uh, expressed some interest in, in doing this sort of thing. In as much as he had done uh, iconography in, in uh, churches and uh, cathedrals in various places in, uh, in Russia. So that led to, uh, to our finding Valery Butersky, professor of art, and now one who came up with the design that eventually ended up being what is on the ceiling today. What other memories? You were all there at St. Petersburg. You all met Valeria and Larissa in their home place. Uh, what would you like to share of that um, magnificent meeting of these wonderful artists? Well, it was a, quite an experience to meet them. We had met them, uh, met Valeri when he came here prior to starting the project. But then to see his work there, and then to see the work that was inspiring him, uh, the, the, the Church of the Resurrection, St. Isaac's Cathedral, uh, all of those things. There's this, this enormous wow factor, and, and it's the same thing that, that I think we've brought into ours in a, in a more modest way, but, but still in a beautiful way. Helen. Well, when we saw uh, Valeri's work uh, at his studio, I was blown away. I mean, it was just sketches at the time. There were just uh, only a few that were sort of completed icons, just to give us an idea what it would look like. But it was really, we were very impressed. And of course, St. Petersburg is such a wonderful city. It's just incredible, uh, the art uh, everywhere. And uh, it, we were very, very impressed. Chris. I didn't have the privilege of going to Russia with these fine people. But let me tell you something about the Patum Prator. Originally, the people in our church expect a big chandelier or couple, uh, to hang from the center of the church where the Patum Prator is now. And there were some who were rather reluctant to go along with our plans. But as it turned out, it was the best thing that happened to us. Of all the plans that one has, it is amazing how things sometimes turn out much, much better because something is not what was originally mm -hmm. part of the package. Now, one thing about Valeri, we have seen a little bit of his art. We're going to see much, much more. But I think it'd be, it would be very valuable to hear something about his faith. So let's play the clip, if we could, when Valeri is answering the question as to the motivation that's behind him as he creates the work that he does for churches. Since I'm a believer myself, I understand how hard it can be to concentrate when I pray in a church. As an artist, my main goal is not to decorate a church, but to prepare parishioners for prayer. Obviously, you were sold on his artistic talents and Larissa's uh, ability, the two of them together. What would have been the extra bonus of having him be such a person of faith? And how did that factor into the commissioning and also into the finished product that we, the, the, the project that is continuing, but that you are seeing in such grandeur already? Well, iconography isn't just art. 
I mean, it, it, it has all the elements of art, but it is necessary for the iconographer to be a person of faith. That's, that's a starting point. We could not, either because we would have been restricted from doing it, or because we wouldn't, would not have been able to, to accept somebody who was not a person of faith in order to do that. It, that's a, a, an important requirement. And it's amazing that Valery is a person of faith because given the history of, this, of Russia and Soviets under Soviet rule, religion was uh, extremely discouraged. And, uh, and as the older people died off, the, the, the younger people didn't even know how to worship. They did not go into to church. So um, it was really an eye-opener when we went there and we attended church services to see the people that are really flocking into the church. They had to teach them everything, how to dress, how to worship, how to prepare for the sacraments, because they had no history. So it was, for me, it was really a very uh, an eye-opener and, and, and very deeply emotional thing to see. And for Valeria and his family to be orthodox, to be religious, uh, was uh, uh, such an added plus had to be. It, it Chris, is. for you, I, how important is all this? I think it's very important. I'll tell you why. Because I sensed that when Larry did this, he could have got up there and just painted anything. And we probably would have accepted it because it was probably good. But when he, when he started painting with his wife, he put body and soul mm -hmm. in every icon. And that's very, very important because it shows. We have one more clip for this first program. We'll be back again next week with another whole program continuing our look at this ongoing project of faith and love and art beyond compare at St. George Greek Orthodox Church. But let's hear the pastor again, Father Jim Pappas, as he helps us describe one more time how the work progressed. Well, it came in stages. First, they did some prototypes for us which we traveled to Russia to see. And then when we did agree that this was the couple we were going to bring over and have do the work, they brought those prototypes over. Plus then they, and, and they had already been working on what I'll call charcoal renderings full scale on brown butcher paper. And they were in scale what they were going to put on the ceiling. Then once they had those things prepared, then they blackened the back of the butcher paper, taped it up to the ceiling, and then began to trace over their renderings onto the ceiling. Now, before that happened, the preparation was having to redo the entire ceiling because it used to have that old 1950s stucco cottage cheesy stuff up there. So we had to put three coats of joint compound, they called it mud, they put three coats of mud on the ceiling, smoothed it out to the specifications of the iconographer, and then we put two coats of cadmium yellow paint, bright, bright, bright paint. The reason being is, is because we wanted a gold background. In iconography, there's only two backgrounds you can use. It's either going to be gold or it's going to be blue. Either one of them represent the heavens. So we decided on gold because it was a little bit darker of a church because of the brick. So we wanted something that would enliven the space more and, and, and bring out a, a, a brightness that was very necessary for in here. So we went with the gold background. So the cadmium yellow is the base coat that would then be covered over by the gold and then in, in brighten the gold, enliven the gold, make it uh, just stand out more. Any base coat that you put under something is going to darken or lighten your top coat. So we made sure that we went as bright as possible. That was two coats of the cadmium yellow, two coats of the gold, and then he started making grids with charcoal on the ceiling. So we had the scaffolding. The scaffolding was from the front up here of the icon screen all the way to the, the rear by the choir loft. And it was in three levels. So that tri-level effect allowed them to climb up there and then to stand and or lay down as was necessary. In fact, the very top platform had a movable platform with a chaise lounge on it that then he could paint laying on his back. 
And so they gridded the entire ceiling in diamonds, triangles, diamonds. And then they took those renderings and put them up there and then traced those renderings, as I mentioned earlier, on there. Once they traced the renderings on the ceiling, then they went ahead with sepia crayon, brown sepia crayon, and they went ahead and did full renderings, shaded, mind you, of all of the various large medallions. So that's all of the characters are up there, the, the four gospel writers, the four evangelists, uh, the large, large one of Christ himself representing God, the ruler of all, or the creator of all, which we call the Pandocratora. And then the, there are one, two, three, eventually going to be four uh, large renderings of Old Testament prophets. And those were magnificent in themselves. And then from there, he just started sketching the various backgrounds and, and florets and, and the angels, and that's and we have what we have. But it was, a, it was a longer process than we assumed it was going to be. We all misjudged the, the length of the project as far as that went. But we do have a masterpiece. And it's a magnificent piece of work. They worked very diligently. They worked with their hearts, uh, their, their soul. Their life is, is really up there for three and a half years. I just hope you enjoyed this magnificent program enough to be joining us next week when we will be sharing with you the continuing work of this magnificent art project at St. George Greek Orthodox Church. Till next week, God bless.